All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to those online as well. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get into our teaching. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for this beautiful day, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come together and study your word and learn from your word, oh God. And Lord, for we thank you for everything that we have learned in the covenants of God, even as we get into learning about the cross, about what you have done, the power of the cross. And Lord, we pray that you will open our hearts, that we will understand your word. We will understand what the cross has done in each of our lives, and we will apply it in our lives. So God, we thank you. Give us the leading, the unction of the Holy Spirit to receive your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we get into our next se section, section two, which is the cross of Jesus Christ. When you talk about the cross, it is the center of human history, a place of redemption. The cross is where we find our faith. The cross is the center of the entire world. Paul writes and he says, we preach Jesus Christ crucified before the foundations of the world. Right? We're going to talk about many aspects of the cross. And even as we look into it, we need to embrace this understanding of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The reality of Jesus' redemptive work on the cross. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And while we were set apart, while we were, you know, in sin, Christ died for us. And people looked at us and said, you deserve to be in that pit. Jesus said, no. Patience one. I will say, you know, you are seated with him in heavenly places. So the cross has done such a marvelous work. A work of redemption. Now here's the thing, we talked about this in Lifestyle Evangelism, 1 Corinthians 1.18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So even as we get into this study, we're studying about the cross. Is it foolishness to us? For them, for some of them, it's foolishness, but to us, it is the power of God. So we must get ready to experience the power of God, even as we study this, right? So let's, you know, even as we begin, let's put our focus on the cross. Okay, so even as we study, let our thoughts think of the cross. Think of that place where Christ made that ultimate sacrifice for the entire human, humankind, right? And with that in our background, let's get into the centrality of the cross. First Corinthians 1, 17 through 25, Paul is writing to a church uh, which is confused, a church which is flowing the gifts of spirit, uh, but they needed to hear this. First Corinthians 1, 17 to 25. Anyone can read, please. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to those who, were, who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, 
and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What an amazing portion of scripture. Here the Apostle Paul is, you know, when you think of Apostle Paul, he's one of the most prominent and influential and, uh, uh, you know, anointed people, person in the New Testament. After Jesus, there was no one like the Apostle Paul. Right? And here he's saying, now, when you look at all the experiences of the Apostle Paul, right? he, uh, you know, if you see his whole life, he, he was somebody who was against Christ, against the following of Christ. We see in the road to Damascus, Jesus, he sees Jesus. Then he goes, he goes to Jerusalem. Three years, he's in Arabia. He's praying for three years. Then after that 14 years, nobody knows about Apostle Paul. Nobody knows who this Apostle Paul is for 14 years. So altogether, 17 years of silence. And now this man is coming up. And all of a sudden, he, you know, God brings him out and he starts his first missionary journey. We know what happens on the missionary journeys. He starts churches and uh, you know, many people are touched and his ministry is growing. But here's what Paul sums up his old ministry. What does he say? If... You know, Paul had the option. He could have spoken about, oh, I saw the vision. Jesus. I saw Jesus. I spoke to Jesus. He could have talked about, I was in Arabia. Remember, Paul writes and he says, I was in what I received from the Lord, I give to you. Talking about the Lord's Supper. Right? He could have spoken about all the testimonies, all the healings, all the great things that he did. But what does he say here? For the message of the cross, no, verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. So Paul is saying, the center of my message, the center of my ministry is the cross. It's not you know that I have gone through these miracles, I've done first missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey, I planted all these churches and I've done all of this. No. He's saying if I talk about all that, I'm talking about my own wisdom and that is foolishness. He's saying if I talk about anything else, then I'm emptying the power of the cross. Paul is saying my ministry, the center focus is the cross of Jesus Christ. What an important lesson for us to learn. In our lives, whatever we are doing, God is going to call many of us into ministry or the work that we're going to do. Remember, this must be our central focus, the cross of Jesus Christ. Why am I living? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Not because of my own work. Not because of my own gifts and skills and abilities. All that is part of it. But because if I depend on that, that's worldly wisdom. Paul is saying, the focus is the cross. Because without the cross, we are nothing. What are we without the cross? Are we anything? Think. We would have still been sinners. But the cross changes everything. Not with words of wisdom. Paul is saying here, the gospel was, the preaching of the gospel was not to be ex not to be an exercise of great oratory, eloquence, intellectual reasoning, or human wisdom. He's saying the cross of Jesus Christ is not just to, of words of wisdom. Now we need wisdom, right? We need to know how to preach. We need to know how to teach. You have to do it in a good way, in an effective way, right? Paul didn't go there and decide, okay, I'll just say whatever I feel like saying. No. I'm sure he would have prepared himself, right? If you see in Acts, when he goes into Corinth, uh, Athens especially, I'm sure he prepared himself, right? We talked about that in lifestyle evangelism. He prepared himself, went and he... But he did not depend on his own wisdom. He did not depend on his own words. Oh, my skill is to talk. Good. But Paul is saying, I didn't depend on my skill. Because my skill can only impress people. And a very good worship leader. Everyone will clap. 
very good why should you oh very powerful message very good that is a skill that god gives us but if the if you're not if you're depending on your own then the power of the cross in that worship in that preaching is nullified it's empty right now we're not saying that you know we should not put effort no. god has given us skills now i can't if i'm leading worship for one hour i have to come up with some songs and do all of that but we, we pray and we say god all these songs i'm going to sing not because i can sing well not because i know how to play an instrument that is your your gift you've given me but to talk about what you have done in my life not my own wisdom not my own strength but if i want to see that time of worship be a blessing to others i should say it is because of the cross not because of me right so it's important in a world today you know we have so many tools we have so many methods we have stage we have led we have led screen stage lights in ears and all of this production that happens is it important yes but that's not the focus you understand where we're coming from right all of this is important but we should not make that the focus and then ministry second if in our ministry we are more focused about stage lights led speakers all of it and we are not and our focus is moved towards that and not focused about people and ministering to people and building people we have got it all wrong yes right all of that will come later on there is a time and a place for that we our mind should be set on the power of the cross only the cross the power of the cross can touch people's life why would you want people to come and listen to you on sunday why should they come is it because we dress up well or is it because we can speak well why should they come they come because there is something because you, when you speak on the message of the cross the power of the cross people's lives are touched and they come what's the use of having a big stage and led screen and lightings and all of that nobody is there what's the use is there any use how did we feel during covid you know those in ministry will say oh this, this zoom and all is not working for me why why is it because by nature we need people ministry is about people right zoom also people only but it's not like ministry it's not like sunday service so i feel why because it, it is not on our own efforts it's about the power of the cross right the message of the cross is the power of god think about this when you and i talk about a man who came into this world who lived a perfect life without any sin was crucified on the cross for our sins when did this happen more than 2000 years ago but even now people are believing in that cross people believe in that man why because it is a real message it's a true message this is 2024 2034 2044 3044 doesn't matter the cross the power of the cross will remain there will be people who will come and tell oh there is no jesus good that is your belief you know jesus was a person who you know was just a good man that's your belief it's foolishness to you but to me it is the power of god the day jesus hung on that tree on the cross gave his life that is one of the most powerful days in history it is the most powerful moment the day jesus says it is finished that moment is the most powerful moment in human kind it is finished three words just three words who is this man that people are following him even now 
even now died in jerusalem he never came to india he never went to america australia nothing 120 miles from his home that's it here to mumbai that's it bangalore to mumbai not, not more than that what is the impact the entire world is talking about it is the cross still powerful still working still powerful in each of our lives when we put our faith in the cross we have god gives us he saves us firstly he heals us he delivers us he breaks every demonic bondage you know you, you look at this right it's, it's so wonderful God put Adam and Eve in the garden and said, see, don't eat from that fruit, tree. You do what you want, don't eat from the tree. They ate. What happened? When God made Adam and Eve, he didn't make them to die. But death, that's why Romans, he says, just as death came into this world because of one man's sin. Who sinned? Adam. Because of one man's sin, death came into this world. Now, the devil is in authority on the earth. He's been given dominion. Why? Because the moment Adam took that fruit and ate it, he's, he, it was like he's, he's, you know, he's taking a key and giving it to the devil. Now the devil has the key. He's taking control over all the things on earth. On the cross, many years later, thousands of years later four thousand odd years later jesus on the cross he died what did he do bible says he you know later on uh, we'll talk about it also he went and he took the keys of death and hell it's like jesus is going to the devil and saying okay you brought death into this world but now i have overcome this death death has no victory now you you made Adam eat the fruit. He ate it. Death came into this world. But now I'm alive. I took up the sins of the world. I died. And now I'm alive. You tried to put me. You, you cannot hold my body down. You cannot. You know, the psalmist says it, there will be not one bone broken in him and his body will not see decay. Nothing happened to Jesus' body. He wars up again. Now Jesus doesn't have a secondary body. Same body. He rose up again and he went and he took the authority from the devil. Just as sin entered one man, so much more righteousness through the one who believes in Jesus Christ. Eternal life because of the cross. We receive all of this. The cross is made real when we apply it in our life, when it becomes true. The cross is not made real when we wear the cross. The cross is not made real when we put a tattoo of the cross. Right? The cross is not real when we think, oh, Jesus was just a good man. The cross is real when we believe what Jesus did on, uh, on the cross for us. Right? So it, it, the cross is surpassing all the wisdom of the world, all of man's brilliance pales in comparison to the wisdom of the cross the brilliance of great philosophers the logic of great minds rational deep arguments and reasonings everything looks foolish when it's compared to the cross why would jesus do this why would god choose this the most horrific method of redemption couldn't jesus have just been okay he came uh, they beat him up, right? Uh, okay, we put him into prison. Okay, then we what we'll do? We'll stab him to death. Stab him to death, or we'll stone him to death. That's better. Just finish it off. Five minutes death. Yes or no? Stephen, how did he die? Five minutes. Take stones through. Five ten minutes, he would have been dead. That's not what God intended. That's not. That's why the writer says in Hebrews. Where the whole wrath of God, the anger of God the Father, of all the sins of the world had to be put on Jesus. It doesn't make sense. Why would I put it on my own son? But he had to do it for you and me. 
was it easy stone jesus and he will die easy way out no but that was not what god intended that's not what god intended or you know apostle paul chop the head over done he had to go through the that's why you know, hebrews again says that he was obedient to death even death on a cross you know, I'll just give you a little bit of history of what the cross is. The cross was founded by the Persians. The Persians came up with this method of the cross. You, how many of you have heard the word excruciating? Right? There's a word called excruciating pain. When you have pain, it's called excruciating. Oh, you got a toothache. Oh, excruciating pain it is intense pain so the word crucifixion came out from the word excruciating so the persians came up with crucifixion but the romans mastered it how did the romans kill the roman crucifixion happen the nails were about this big right the romans were professionals in crucifixion Right. Now, we don't know. Some of them, some historians say he was nailed here. Some historians say he was nailed here. Doesn't matter. Wherever he was nailed, he was nailed. But picture this Jesus was completely naked on the cross. Completely naked. And they have put those nails into his wound into his hands and they put that nail into his feet and apart from that before that they had you know flogged him and beaten him when the moment you're on the cross you have lost all your rights you're worse than a thief you're worse than a prisoner Jesus what you see in passion of the Christ is nothing I believe that we could have seen his organs. We could have seen his heart pumping. Jesus died of a cardiac arrest. Every time he breathed like that, the heart would have stopped. It would have gotten slower and slower and slower. The wrath of God, the entire anger of God was upon him. That was, that's why the cross is powerful. The blood of Jesus is powerful. You think, you know, the devil, when he, when the moment you and I believe in the cross, the moment we say, by the blood of Jesus, and you know the value of that, the devil has no place, there is no chance at all for him to come. Picture this in the book of Job. Job goes, you know, he goes to, the throne room of God and says, sorry, the devil goes to the throne room of God and says, and God says, hey, are you trying to attack my friend, my, the righteous man, Job? He said, yes, but you have put a hedge around him, so I can't do anything to him. Have you read that verse? Job, God, you have put a hedge around Job, so I can't do anything to him. Take out that hedge, then I will do, then let me see. I'll bring pain and affliction on him, he will curse you. Now, this is the old covenant. Now, think about the new covenant. What the cross did. When we speak the blood of Jesus, there is no devil that can come against us. You know, sometimes we ask, why is it that I'm going through these problems? Sometimes God orchestrates those problems in our life just so that we depend on him and trust on him. Right? But that's a different uh, story altogether, right? It pleases God when the cross is preached. What a powerful example. Imagine you are sharing the gospel with one person. It pleases God. God is happy that you are preaching, you are sharing the gospel. Now, God is not saying, wait a minute, did you finish your Bible college? Have you finished CTH or DTH or at least BTH? For BTH, you should know everything. God is not saying all that. You know the cross, 
you preach the cross, God is pleased. First Corinthians 121. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Look at that. God ordained that through the, through the foolishness of preaching, people will be saved. Is it foolish? Imagine you're standing and you're preaching. Oh, we're all sinners. Christ died for us. You know, we were without hope. Jesus died for us. Now, if you put your faith in Jesus, he will make you a new person. Your sins are washed away. Now, you've got some 10 people listening to you. What is what only is saying? I don't know. But out of that 10, eight people may say, foolish. We're talking about this in 2024. But two people will say, this is a power of God. I feel something in my life. Something has touched me. It pleases God when you preach the gospel, when you share about the gospel. He will save everyone who believes. So every time you share, every time you communicate the message of the cross, you are pleasing God. And even if people make fun of you, if they ridicule you, preach it anyway because you're doing what pleases God. Think of it this way. Jesus is, you know, went through all the shame, suffering, bitterness and pain for you. The least we can do is to believe in him and to share this message. Of course, when we look at the New Testament, the early church, they went through a lot of challenges because of this message. What was it in this message? You, know, you think about it. The disciples were so scared. They were so worried. Oh, what will happen to us? Jesus was with us. They were fully bold. They are walking everywhere. Oh, they, they, like bodyguards. You know? Just becoming famous. They are famous also. No? Jesus is famous. Disciples become famous. Everyone knows. But when Jesus is gone, Peter is saying, I'll go back to fishing. The others are saying, I can't handle this. Jesus is not there. But what happened? That same fearful people were so bold that all of them gave their life to Christ. Imagine they would have said, if you don't change your, if you don't deny Christ, we will kill you. Go ahead, kill me. What was there about that cross? That they're willing to give their life. It is the power of God. It was the power of God that broke into their lives and changed them and said, it doesn't matter what you do. Look at Stephen. He gave that whole message from Moses. He started off. Abraham, Moses, in Acts chapter, uh, Acts, I think it's Acts, or Acts 4, right? 3 or 4. Uh, and he's sharing that whole thing. This is what Abraham, Moses, uh, all through the descendants. And then comes to Jesus and they said, what? Foolishness, you're talking Jesus. We crucified him. Let's take stones and throw it. He didn't say, okay, hold on, hold on. Before you throw stones, uh, I want to tell you something. Uh, actually, the message was, you know, no, no. There was not a flinch in him. He stood there and said, Father, forgive them. What a powerful testament, right? It pleases God. The audience can't change the message. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23. For the Jews request a sign. The Greeks are after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews it's a stumbling block. And to the Greeks it's foolishness. Listen, look at this. The Jews, all through the Old Testament, what did they want to see? What did they want? Signs. That's all they wanted. Why? The habit came from Moses. The Jews are there, uh, miracle after miracle after miracle. They're seeing signs, they're seeing everything. It's become normal. So for anything, they want a sign. Now the Greeks are full of wisdom. They look at the stars and they decide, okay, okay, this is what is going to happen. They have, they read, they're philosophers, full of wisdom. So for the Jews, if there is no sign, it's not good, not enough. And for the Greeks, if there's no proper explanation, that's not enough. So Paul is saying here, they may be people who want a sign. They may be 
people who want an explanation. But we preach Christ crucified. That does not change. Whether you like it, whether you don't like it, this is the message. Can you change the message? Uh, instead of Jesus being crucified, all this taking sins is good. But instead of crucifixion, we'll say something else. The message does not change. The message, the power is in the cross. So whether people believe, whether people don't believe, the, the audience doesn't matter. And the audience cannot change the message. They may come up with ideas to change it, but the message will remain the main message. Right? The cross is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.24 but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Wiser than man's highest wisdom and more powerful than man's greatest strength. Okay, let's go to the next portion. The whole purpose of incarnation was this. Why did Jesus come into the world? Because he knew that he had to die on the cross. It was not Jesus suddenly when he was 30 years old, you know, God the Father told him, okay, I have one plan. The plan is for three and a half years you do ministry. And after three and a half years, uh, you will be crucified. No. The whole purpose of incarnation was decided before the foundations of the world. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. Look at that. Look at that verse. May, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. What does John chapter 1 verse 1 say? John 1 1, you should know this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Word was God. So, in the beginning, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit was one. Imagine this. The angels are bowing down, singing, Holy, holy is the Lord, great almighty in heaven, all of this glory. The God who created the heavens and the earth. This God decided to come down as a man. He left all his glory and he came down as a man. It says here, yeah. made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. Okay, just think of it. Every time when you look at Jesus' ministry, you, you, you think of this in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? They come to Jesus, the, the Roman guards and all come and say, Who is Jesus? We need to arrest him. What does he say? I am he. When he said, I am he, what happened to them? They fell backwards. They fell down to the ground. Simple man. There was nothing different about Jesus. If you were there alive, you would have seen Jesus. Normal person. The book of Isaiah says there is no there was no greatness in him that is oh so nice Jesus is. No. Simple man. Wearing the same clothes where everyone what everyone was wearing. Probably went to the same school, studied. Right? Or ate the same food during he didn't eat all these fancy foods. What everyone ate, he ate. If Jesus was born during this time, he would have been on WhatsApp. But he was born in that century. So a normal person walking around. The things that he did was the demonstration of who he was. He was not just a man. He was the creator of the world, creator of the universe. Imagine 
he sends the people, uh, the disciples ahead, and then he decides, okay, the boat is far away, and he begins to walk on the water. Who can do that? Jesus decides something, he'll do it. I always think of this. Do you think Jesus could have come down from the cross? And they said, if he is the son of man, who he claims to be, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. Do you think Jesus could have come down from the cross? Yes or no? How long will it take? Forget about come down from the cross. All you need to do is, uh, Michael, come now one minute. Michael is the archangel. <laughs> Michael, just finish these fellows and take me out of this. Like that. You would have wiped out everyone and just got down from the cross. Forget about getting down. It would have, you would have just stood in glory. Ah, see, I told you, no. I am the son of God. He didn't need to, he didn't prove anything to anyone. He made himself of no reputation. They spat on him. They pulled his beard. They mocked him. They put a crown of thorns and said, Oh, you are the king of the Jews. But he went through all of that for you and me. Imagine he saw you and me when he's going through all of this. No, I have to do this. I have to do this for Paul. I have to do this for Joseph. I have to do this for all of you online. I have to do this. He saw you even before the foundation of the world. What love is this? Verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The most humiliating death anybody can go through. You can throw a bucket of vomit on a person who is crucified. Nothing will happen. Nobody will say anything. A leper is more valued than a person who is crucified. Do you know that? If given a choice, they'll go and stand with a leper instead of standing with somebody who's crucified. Even death on a cross. Therefore, here's the interesting part. Therefore, God exalted, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name, that under the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The day Jesus died, the day he said it is finished, he destroyed the devil's work. The book of Colossians says he triumphed over the devil by crushing him. He made a public spectacle of the enemy. You know what is public spectacle? I've shared this before, right? When India won the World Cup, what did they do? They went and sat in the room and slept. What did they do? They went, they decided some cities. They said, we'll take one open bus. And then they put that World Cup there in between. And all the people came on the streets. What are they doing? Yes, India won the World Cup. You know what Jesus did? Jesus destroyed the devil, nullified, broke the chains of the devil. He made a public spectacle. How is that public spectacle? He rose again from the dead. And he stood. And he met with his disciples. And it says here that Therefore, God exalted him above high that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess. Every demon will have to bow at the name of Jesus. Listen, demons cannot do anything to you. One, either, either we open the door or two, God allows it to teach us. Right? To bring us closer to him, to continue to trust in him. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. And what, why did he do this? 
from the foundation of the world the cross was not an afterthought it was god's plan even before the foundations of the world revelation 13 8 all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose name has not been written in the book of book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so when god said genesis chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning god ah before that only god had decided the cross is going to happen before Genesis 1 1. You think of that? You see the wisdom of God? It's not an afterthought. It's not like, okay, what do we do? Now Adam shouldn't have eaten the fruit. No. Before God said, in the beginning, God, in Genesis 1 in the beginning, God created. Before that, God already knew that this is going to happen. It's not an afterthought. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Which none of the rulers of the age knew. For they had known. For if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And Jesus was walking around. Nobody believed it. Now, if they knew it, they would not have crucified Jesus. Why, why was it so offensive, what Jesus was saying? Because they could not take it. The Jews still believed that Jesus will come on the clouds riding on a white horse. He'll come and they used to believe that they'll come, he'll come and destroy the Roman government. How destroy? Now Jesus is saying, you go pay taxes. They got even more angry. Why should we pay taxes? You're a Jew. Jesus said, give to the give to the Romans what give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, you give to God what belongs to God. Simple. But the Jews had a different understanding. And here Jesus is saying, before the foundation of the world, they did not know, they did not see it, they did not understand him. But he did the work. Jesus foretold his crucifixion. Many, many places. Mark 16, 21 to 23. Can we read that, please? Sorry, Matthew 16, 21 to 23. It's on your notes. Matthew 16, 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day then peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying far be it from you lord this shall not happen to you but he turned and said to peter get behind me satan you are an offense to me for you are not mindful of the things of god but the things of men yeah we know the story right Jesus is telling the disciples, okay, listen, one day I must go to Jerusalem. I will suffer. I will be put to death. Peter is saying, no, 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 no. no. I will not let that happen. Lord, let it not happen. And Jesus rebukes him and says, I get thee behind me, Satan, because what you're thinking is a worldly thinking. We had already decided this before the foundations of the world. You were not even born. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we three were there. We were having a discussion. It was already decided before. The Father said, let there be light. We have decided it. You're saying, don't want, don't go to the cross. Don't, don't want death. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. He, Peter, Jesus knew that it was not Peter. Peter was talking out of love for Jesus. Can't blame him. He's saying, no, let's not. If I was there, I would have said the same thing. No, no, Jesus, will instead of this, we'll go live in Samaria. They all like us over there. Jesus said, no. That thought is from the enemy. I've come because I know that this is what this is the reason why I have come. And I have to give my life. 
Jesus purposed to go on the cross. There were many opportunities presented to Jesus to avoid death on a cross. Right? One was Satan's temptations. Right? What did Satan do? He tempted Jesus. 40 days, Jesus is fasting. He tempted Jesus. Okay, if I turn it to turn the stone to bread and eat it, nothing will happen. But he would have fallen into sin. Why? Because he's fallen into temptation. Two, uh, the second one, he says, if you jump down, uh, you, the angels of God will come. He avoided that temptation. And then the Bible says, uh, you know, he Satan left him for a while. That means what? He would have come back again. It's not like only three temptations. You think Satan will tempt us three times a day for us? Five times a day? Oh, it's going to go. He's not going to leave it. You imagine how many times he would have tempted Jesus. He would have come again and again and again. No, you can't do it. You can't take up the sins of the world. You can't do this. It's not possible. How is it possible? Now see, you're hungry. You're going to die. Without food, you can't live. You need food. You need water. It's been 40 days. Now, the enemy can also bring out all the natural aspects. If you don't drink water, your stomach will burn. All kinds of things the enemy can bring. You don't limit the enemy. He can do what he wants. Jesus overcame all those temptations. That's why he was sinless. His disciples, as was Peter, at the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember we talked about it last week, last class? If not this way, Lord, is there any other way but not my will? If he said, Lord Jesus, Father, I can't do this. Maybe, I don't know, the Father would have said, Okay, come back up. But he was obedient to death. He was obedient to death. There was an opportunity, but he didn't fall for it. Then uh, 72,000 angels, Mark 26, Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant uh, struck, sorry, uh, and suddenly one of those who were with Jesus, that was Peter, uh, stretched out his hand and drew a sword and struck the servant in his ear, uh, cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for who will live by the sword will perish by the sword. Look at verse 53, powerful. Or do you think I cannot pray to my father and he will provide for me more than 72 legions of angels? One word, if I say the Father can send 72,000 angels and destroy all these people, but it has to happen this way as the scriptures have, have said, have been written, it has to happen this way. Jesus was obedient to that. Right, okay, we'll come back from the break and continue.